Okay, so today we're going to prove uh, the awesomest theorem in analysis of Boolean functions, or at least the one that started it all off in a sense, uh, the Konkali Lineal Theorem from 1988. And uh, to do that, we'll need to prove some aspect of the hypercontractive inequality, but it'll just be this Bonami lemma we stated last time, which is very easy. So although this is sometimes considered like a hard or non-elementary result, we're going to do it all from soup to nuts today, and you can tell me what you think at the end of it. Okay, so let me remind you of this Bonami lemma. Uh, it's basically about the fact that if you take a plus or minus one random bits, those are very reasonable random variables, and if you combine them in a low degree way, then the result is still a pretty reasonable random variable. So let f be any uh, Boolean function into the reals, with degree at most k. And let x1 through xn be random bits, as they always are for us. Independent. Then this random variable, f of x, is pretty reasonable, where the reasonableness depends on k as 9 to the k. And to remind you what that means, it means that the fourth norm is not too much bigger than the second norm. Okay, so expected value of f to the fourth is at most 9 to the k. Expected value of f of x squared, um, squared. Okay, or if you want to take the fourth root of this inequality, you can write it as the fourth norm of f is at most root 3 to the k times the two norm. All right, and as I said before, uh, one very pleasant thing about this inequality is that uh, it looks a little confusing, but if you just tell yourself, I'm going to prove this by induction on n, then you will automatically prove it. Well, you may need like one tiny hint at one spot, so if you ever get stuck, the hint is to use Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so we'll do the proof now. And it's by induction on n. Okay, so we're going to prove uh, by induction on n the statement that this holds for all k. And uh, just to get something trivial out of the way, we may always assume But k is at least 1. Why is that? Well, suppose k is 0, or f is the 0 function. Uh, if k is less than 1, then f has to be a constant function. Okay, and then you just have, this is like some constant to the fourth, and that's the same constant to the fourth. Okay, so this inequality does indeed hold true with k equal to 0. <coughs> okay, great. Um, all right, so we're doing it by induction on n. So the base case is n equals 0. That's also an easy trivial case. If n is 0, then, uh, well, f is just a number. It's a constant as well. So again, you have a constant, the same constant, and then this is at least 1 for all natural numbers k. So n equals 0 is also an easy case. So we've eliminated all the easy cases. Now we have to do something. Uh, okay, so for the general case, n is at least 1. Well, you have a polynomial. Think of f as like a multilinear polynomial, like we did in you know, day one of this class. And there's n variables, and you're trying to use induction on n. So it's natural just to sort of write f as the part that depends on n. Uh, plus some part that does not depend on xn. Okay, this isn't really a proper notation, but you know what, if you have a polynomial, I'll take the, the stuff that involves xn and factor it out, and then take the stuff that doesn't involve xn. So actually, if you're really quick with all our notation and you remember things, uh, well, you'll know, actually, this is like the 
the stuff in F's Fourier expansion that involves the nth variable, but then like with xn like deleted from it. So does anybody remember what that is in our notation? So this is the derivative with respect to xn, all right? So this is xn times the derivative with respect to the nth variable of f. Remember, the derivative of Fourier expansion is the sum over all the stuff that involves the nth variable, but uh, with that variable taken out. And the remaining stuff is just, you know, it's like the sum over all s, the subset of 1 through n minus 1 of f hat s chi s. Uh, and if you remember, like, homework two or something, we even had a notation for this. We called it uh, E and F of X. Because it's really like what you would get if you uh, sort of took F and averaged out the XN coordinate. Okay, that was just uh, for sort of fun to remind you of these things, just because they have names, uh, but it's really just you know, XN times the multilinear part that involves XN and the part that doesn't involve XN. Okay, and the only real thing we'll need to note is that the degree of this thing is, of course, at most k minus 1, okay? Because the degree of this is at most k, and you're multiplying it by 1x here. This thing, uh, it could have degree k as well. So all we can say about this is that it's degree at most k. Um, but we also have that um, both of these things depend on just n minus 1 variables. Okay, None of the, neither of them involves xn, so they're good things that we can use induction on, right? They just involve n minus 1 variables. Okay, so uh, let's just simplify notation a little bit. You should think of x as a random variable, so then xn is a random uh, bit. This thing is also a random variable, so just for simplicity, I'm going to write f for f of x and little d for this other polynomial and little e for this other polynomial. Okay, so I'm just going to write this equation as f equals xn times d plus e. Okay, but f, d, and e are random variables that depend on x1 through xn. Actually, d and e only depend on x1 through xn minus 1. Okay. Everything okay so far? We're just doing the thing that you would do if you were doing induction on n variate polynomials. Okay, well, there's nothing much else to do. I mean, to continue along, but we need to look at this thing, expected value of f to the fourth. So let's do it. Uh, well, expected value of f to the fourth. We write it as expected value of xn times d plus e to the fourth. All right, and let's just expand it out. Let's do it. So you get expected value of uh, xn to the fourth, d to the fourth. I'm going to also use linearity of expectation, I guess. Uh, for expected value xn cubed, d cubed, e to the one, plus six expected value of xn squared, d squared, e squared, plus 4 expected value of xn d e cubed plus, I wonder if this will all fit on the screen, uh, expected value of e to the fourth. Well, it's so easy. I mean, anybody following along will just know what I've written even if it doesn't appear. Okay, now here we'll, uh, we've got some expectations of products. We would like to simplify them if we can. And here we'll use the critical observation which is just that um, d and e are independent random variables of xn. Okay? So d and e, these things do not involve xn. And x1 through xn are independent. Great. So whenever we have, like, inside a piece here that involves xn, we can just take it out. So let's do that. So we get expected value of xn to the fourth. Expected value of d to the fourth, plus a four. Expected value xn cubed. Expected value d cubed e plus, I'll stop saying it aloud. Uh, 
Там, там, там. Great. All right. Now some of these things are just uh, numbers. For example, what is this number? Yeah, xn is plus or minus 1, so that's 1. This number is 0. xn cubed is just the same as xn, and the expected value of a bit is 0. xn squared is 1, so that's 1. This is 0. OK. So that simplified things a lot, so let's write that out. We've got expected value d to the fourth plus 6, expected value d squared e squared plus expected value e to the fourth. Okay? It's great. Uh, well, we're going to apply induction here and here, and I'll let you think about what we're going to do with the middle thing. Uh, but let's pause, since we also have expected value of f of x squared on the right-hand side. I mean, let's just do what we just did over there, too. OK, so on the right-hand side, we have expected value of f squared squared. Let me square it later. So we have expected value of f squared. This is like our computation of expected value of f to the fourth, only less painful. So we get, OK, we're going to get expected value of xn squared d squared. And similarly, the xn squared can come out and turn into a 1. Actually, it's just constantly 1 anyway. So we're going to get expected value of d squared. On the cross term, we'll get expected value of xn de. We can take the expected value of xn out, and it's 0. So that term actually goes away. And the last thing we have is expected value of little e squared. Is that OK? OK, so the right-hand side, therefore, is equal to, well, it's got this 9 to the k, so let's keep that around. 9 to the k times the square of this. So I'll just write that out. It's expected value of d squared squared plus 2, expected value of d squared, expected value of e squared plus expected value of e squared squared. So far, so good. So uh, I guess you can see we're in relatively outstanding shape here. Uh, like, this left-hand side, OK, let's take a look at this. We're just going to apply induction to this, right? It's on n minus 1 variable, so we can apply induction. E has degree k at most, so just apply induction. You're going to get 9k expected value of e squared squared. So that's exactly going to, you know, the last terms are going to be bounded as desired. Uh, yeah, so, OK, let me go on. So. The, by induction on the left hand side, well, expected value of d to the fourth is at most, actually d has degree at most k minus 1. So we can even put in 9 to the k minus 1 expected value of d squared squared, which is, you know, by a factor of 9, better than what we need. Okay, and as I said, the expected value of e to the fourth, which is we have on the left-hand side, is at most 9 to the k, e to the expected value of e squared squared, so we're in good shape. OK, so the only other thing we have to deal with is expected value, 6 times expected value of d squared, e squared. So what should we do here? d Yes, yeah, so we should apply Cauchy-Schwarz and get that this is at most 6. Uh, square root, expected value of d fourth. Square root, expected value of e to fourth. All right, and now we should obviously imply induction. Okay, so we get, this is at most by induction, uh, 6. Okay, now we are going to be happy about the fact that since d is degree k minus 1, we can stick a 9 to the k minus 1 in. So we'll get square root 9 to the k minus 1. 
And then we get expect square root of expected value of d squared squared. So it's just expected value of d squared. And then over here, all we can do is put in our 9 to the k, expected value over e squared. Uh, but now we're OK. So think of this as 9 to the minus 1 is like a ninth. I'll pull that out with the square root. That's like a third. And I'll put that third against the 6 to get 2. And then what I've left with is like 2 square roots of 9 to the k, which is just 9 to the k, which I'll write first. 9 to the k times 2 times expected value of d squared, expected value e squared. Um, and that's it. Now I've done. I wrote it, wrote it in a weird way, but left-hand side was this. And then I bounded all the terms, this one against this one, this one against that one, and this one against that one. OK, that's it. Any questions? OK, great. Done. Um, let me make one small comment about some uh, slightly weird aspect of this proof. It looked like we had a little bit of slack at one point. Like, this term worked out like perfectly, this term worked out perfectly, and here we're just like, well, we have this extra factor of 9, so that's no problem. Uh, so what that means, actually, is we could actually um, take a weaker hypothesis. See, what was exactly going on in this expected uh, d fourth term? Where did it come from? It came from like here. And you see it came from here, and it had an expected value of xn to the fourth against it. And we we're like, well, that's 1. And what I want to say is, even if expected value of xn to the fourth was 9, or some number at most 9, this proof would have been fine. Right? We just have like, OK, there'd be like a 9 here, and then uh, you know, there'd be like an extra 9 here, and this would go away, but everything would be cool. Right? So, um, you know, this is, like a, this is a pretty small remark, but we may as well, I don't know, remember that fact. So in fact, what we can say is, Bonami lemma, let f be like this, a multilinear polynomial. And we can change this hypothesis to let x1 through xn be independent. Let me say, I'll continue the statement over here. Satisfying, all we really needed was some facts about the moments, that expected value of xi was 0. We definitely used that. And we used the fact that the expected value of xi squared is 1. We used that. We used the fact that the expected value of xi cubed is 0. Uh, but you know, as I said, we only really need that expected value of xi to the fourth is at most 9. Okay, so actually, you know, this is like a slightly stronger statement. You can have slightly more kinds of random variables than just random bits. For example, um, these xi's could be standard normals. You see, because if you have a standard normal, it's mean 0, variance 1, third norm is 0 because it's symmetric. And as was pointed out last time, the fourth moment is 3, which is at most 9. So in fact, you can even have like some of them are bits and some of them are normals. Some of them are some other variables that satisfy these. You can have a mix. That's a small comment, but we'll eventually use that fact later. So I want to record it now. Any questions about that? Yeah. Technically, you mean that if you have xi squared, it's less than or equal to 1, right? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that would be fine. Yep. Because we only use it here, and this is non negative, so it would be fine. Oh, no, actually, I'm not so sure. We actually use it on the right-hand side, too. So I'm not 100% sure of that. I have to double check. When we wrote expected value of f squared, we used the fact that the square of the xi's was 1. We didn't use this at all on the right-hand side, the fourth one. OK. You also might be thinking, like, uh, that's weird. Like, maybe instead of, like, Weakening the hypothesis like this, we could have just strengthened our conclusion and like 
but uh, it's not possible. It's not too hard to show that. You cannot put any number smaller than 9 here. OK. Uh, that should work, right? Anything that's equal to 1 should work, because then I can make any random variable and satisfy. Well, any random variable with the first and third means 0, I can satisfy, make it by just scaling down. Oh, yeah, that's true. That won't work. That's a good point by Pravesh. Assuming you have a symmetric random variable, so the odd moments are 0, you couldn't also have less than or equal to 1 here, because then you could get it sort of for any random variable just by dividing the random variable by a huge constant. OK, good point. So in, in a sense, the, the variable xi itself has to be like uh, 9 reasonable and symmetric. OK, great. Um, OK, so uh, that's all we need to do a lot of like the m more advanced theorems in an analysis of Boolean functions. We can prove this FKN theorem I mentioned a while ago. We're going to prove the KKL theorem today. This is enough to prove this invariance principle that we'll prove eventually in the class. So you know, 85% of stuff that uses this hypercontractivity theorem just needs this easy lemma. OK, so once we have this lemma, uh, you, it helps to like massage it into some slightly different forms. So I'll spend a little while just like monkeying around with it, not doing anything um, you know, sophisticated, just um, yeah, monkeying around. So uh, here's, for example, an immediate corollary. Uh, let f be a function into the reals. Then, if you look at t, this is the t operator, the noise operator, 1 over root 3, it looks a little odd, but applied to the degree k part of f, 4 norm, that's at most, the 2 norm of the degree k part of f. OK, I, I'm not sure I officially introduced this notation, but this notation, f equals k, is just delete all the stuff that's not at degree exactly k. Um, OK, so why is that? Uh, well, it's trivial, actually, because you see, if f, all of its Fourier, OK, this f equals k, it's like a homogeneous degree k polynomial. So when you hit it by t 1 over root 3, remember, that has the Fourier effect of multiplying all the degree k coefficients by the parameter to the power of k. So this is just literally equal to uh, 1 over root 3 to the k times this homogeneous degree k polynomial. This is all of the Fourier masses at degree k. Now this is just a number, so you can take it out of a norm. So it equals 1 over root 3 to the k times uh, the 4 norm of f. And now we can just apply Bonami lemma. See this f degree k part of f is degree at most k, so its 4 norm is at most root 3 to the k times its 2 norm. So you just automatically get this is at most the 2 norm times root 3 to the k, and the root 3 to the k is canceled. Um, OK, now, you know, we have just by this definition, f is the sum as k goes from 0 to n of the degree k part. I'm just saying, if you take a polynomial, you can split it up into the homogeneous degree 0 part, degree 1 part, degree 2 part, etc. So if you're not very good at math, you might just like look at this and say, I'm going to sum this over k, and then hopefully I would just get the following by summing over k. Uh, for all f into the reals, t1 over root 3 f 4 norm is at most f 2 norm. Uh, that's wrong, though. Uh, it doesn't work. Like, one side is OK. Like, the triangle inequality for norms is like working on your side on one side. Uh, I guess the left-hand side, but it's working like the wrong way on the right-hand side, so 
That would be an invalid use of math. Um, but this is actually true. That's a theorem. And uh, you have two choices on how to prove it. You can actually do it with some weird, like a bunch of like three more extra tricks and make this sum over k thing work. But it's also equally just easy to like put both sides to the power of 4 so that this thing becomes expected value of t, f, oh, sorry, put both sides here to the 4. So this becomes the expected value of t, f to the 4th. And this becomes expected value of f squared squared. And then just do the exact same inductive proof that we did for Bonami lemma. Okay? So in fact, I asked you to do that on your homework. Just prove this by induction on n. The proof is virtually identical to what we did in class with Bonami lemma. Okay, so I will just uh, pretend that you did that homework. And you did the exact same inductive proof, and you got this fact. Uh, okay, this, if you want a fancy name for it, could be called the 2, 4, hypercontractivity theorem. Okay, so it's a long and fancy name. What's going on in this statement? Uh, basically, this is a quantification of the fact, or the idea, that if you take a Boolean function and you hit it with the noise operator, it kind of smooths the functions out. Remember, f t sub 1 over root 3, or t sub rho as the probabilistic definition, that its value as a point is like the average of s values over some kind of noisy neighborhood. Okay, so you kind of think if f is kind of like a, got a lot of spiky values, like f of x is like a weird and unreasonable random variable, once you apply this noisy smoothing out operator t, it should make things nicer. And this sort of exactly quantifies that effect. It's called hypercontractivity theorem because if you remember on the homework, you proved that like for any t, and if I had written 4 here, a t of something can only decrease norms. And that's called, you know, contractivity. And so when people figured this out, they're like, oh, it not only increases norms, but even like it takes a larger norm bounded by a smaller norm. So they're like hypercontractivity. Um, okay, so... That's it. Any questions about that statement? Okay, good. So, well, uh, that looks okay, but, oh, let me also mention that later, not today, but like later in class, uh, a later class, we'll prove a generalization, which you might even guess or hope is true, that t1 over square root q minus 1 f q norm is at most f2 for all f. Okay, so this kind of tells you, oh, this is for q at least 2. So it's the same kind of theorem. This is the q equals 4 case. And it kind of tells you, as q goes from 2 to infinity, this ranges between 0 and 1. So for each, like, kind of t row, it sort of tells you exactly how much it's smoothening or uh, reasonableizing this random variable f. Okay, to make a really high norm go down, you have to apply a lot of noise and vice versa. Okay, so, you know, 85% of the applications of hypercontractivity just use Bonami or equivalently this thing, and, like, 99% of them just use this, and then... There's some full version where, like, you have q and p, and there's, like, root p minus 1, root q minus 1 over here, and that's very rarely important, although we'll probably prove it eventually for culture's sake. Um, okay. But let's go back to what we have. Um, and there's one disappointing aspect of this theorem, which is that, like, what, what is this? I mean, the two-norm of f, that's a nice concept. What is like the 4 norm of the t1 over root 3 of f. It just looks kind of weird, you know? What would be kind of awesome is if, like, somehow you could switch this 2 and the 4. Like, if you had the 2 norm of t, t rho applied to f, that's kind of nice. That's like this noise stability. Uh, let me just make that more clear. Uh, suppose that somehow instead of the 4th norm of t, we had, like, the 2 norm of t, f. So, like, t1 over root 3, f in 2 norm. Okay, well, that's just the square root of uh, the x 
expected square of this function, which sometimes we would write as t1 over root 3f, inner product t1 over root 3f. OK. I don't think I ever asked you to prove this, but uh, if you know what all these words mean, this t is a self-adjoint operator, which means that if you ever have like t rho f g, it's the same as f t rho g. That's because basically in this experiment, you pick x at random and look at g of x, and then you make y a noisy version of it and look at f of y. But it's the same if you did x and y in the opposite order, because it's symmetric. Or you can just note that what I'm saying here is that this is equal to, I'm applying this fact to move one of the t's over. This is equal to like f t1 over root 3, t1 over root 3, f. Now, if you don't believe that, you can just also use the Fourier formula, which you can also use to prove this if you want. Uh, the Fourier action of t1 over root 3 on f is to multiply the degree k stuff by 1 over root 3 to the k. OK, so it's like you do that here, you do that here, and then you take their inner product, and Plancherel tells you you'll get, OK, let me leave the square root up, you'll get sum over s, the Fourier coefficients of this guy times the Fourier coefficients of this guy. So you'll get f hat s squared, and you'll get 1 over root 3 to the s twice. So you'll get 1 over 3 to the cardinality of s. OK? So you, you will also get it here, because if you apply t1 over root 3 to f, you multiply the degree k part by root 1 over root 3 to the k, and then you do it again. So the degree k part goes up by like 1 third to the k. OK, and this is uh, like the noise stability. This is the square root of the noise stability at 1 third of f. OK, um, so that's, as I said, it's very pleasant. This two norm of T of F has got like a combinatorial meaning. It's noise stability at F. It's, uh, it's got a nice combinatorial meaning. Unfortunately, these fours and twos, if only they were somehow swapped. Well, luckily, there's some like yet another sort of stupid trick that you can do that if you've done a lot of analysis, you'd know. Uh, that lets you kind of swap these norms across two using Holder's inequality. So I'll do that. It's just another like kind of dumb trick. As I said, we're just going to take this Bonami lemma and like mess around for a while to see what we can deduce. And that'll have the effect of getting t1 over root 3f2 norm into the picture, which is enjoyable because it has this nice combinatorial interpretation. So here's like a little silly analysis trick. So the thing that we really enjoy is the two norm of Tf squared. That's actually great. This is the noise stability at one third of f. OK, so as we saw, I just squared it, but as we saw, it's the same as um, this. F inner product of F with T1 over root 3, T1 over root 3, F. OK, so we have like expected value of this function times this function, or like inner product. We can now use Holder's inequality, which we will. So I'm going to say this is at most hol by Holder's inequality. Well, it's like you get some norm of f, which I'll write in a second, times some norm of this thing, which I'll write in a second. And uh, these norms should have the property that the reciprocals add up to 1. Those are like Holder conjugates. OK, and what's the one thing we know? The one thing we know is if you have like the fourth norm of t of something, then you can do something. So here's our t. So let's decide to make this 4. So then 4 and like 1 over 4 plus 1 over something equals 1. This something is uh, 4 thirds. Okay, so 4 and 4 thirds are conjugate exponents in Holder's inequality. So 
we can put four thirds here. Okay. Um, great. So now let's apply this to for hypercontractivity theorem because we have t applied to some function here, fourth norm. So that's at most. This is by hypercontractivity. F to four thirds norm, and then it, I still have a, one copy of t left. Two norm. <coughs> Great. So now I will divide by this. It appears on both sides. Divide and square. Okay, and we get the following nice looking uh, corollary. Uh, here's a corollary. Again, if f is any function into the reals, then, uh, well, I divide by this thing in square, I get the two norm of t of f squared, which is the stability at one third of f, is at most the four-thirds norm of f. Okay, so that might look like only partial progress. I mean, we turned this into something that we like. Now this looks a little bit weird, but it's kind of less weird, as we'll see in a second. There's some cases where that's a very nice quantity. Uh, we need an extra square on there. Okay. Any questions about that? That might look a little unmotivated, but like, I don't know, this Functional analysis people, they kind of know, like, whenever you see this, you can do this holder trick and get it the other way, on the other side of two. Okay, so uh, that looks nice. Now, in our most favorite circumstance, we have functions who, that are Boolean-valued functions that map into plus or minus one. And if you apply this corollary to such functions, you get something that's stupid because, okay, remember, this is expected value of f of x to the four-thirds to the three-fourths times two. Uh, and so if f plus or minus one, this is just one. So you get like the noise stability is at most one, which is dumb. But if f, if you decide, hey, let's have it map into zero one, then something awesome comes out. So let's write that awesome thing down. Here's yet a further corollary. Uh, so let f go into 0, 1. Okay, this is the case that we were talking about before. Uh, let alpha be the mean of f. Okay? So you could think of f as the 0, 1 indicator of the subset of the hypercube of density or volume alpha. Then we just get immediately uh, that its noise stability at one third is at most. Well, now this thing raising the four thirds doesn't matter. You'll just get alpha to the three halves. Okay, and this is a special case. This is a good result. This is a special case of that small set expansion theorem on the hypercube that I told you about that sort of quantifies a statement that small subsets, think of alpha as small, small subsets of the Boolean cube have like very, are very noise sensitive. Okay, they have very small noise stability. Um, remember that thing in general was like, uh, that one was saying if um, A is a subset of the cube of volume alpha, then the probability when x and y are rho correlated that y is in A given that x is in A is at most, I think it was alpha to 1 minus rho over 1 plus rho. Yeah. So this, this thing is this noise stability divided by alpha. Okay, so you get alpha to the 1 half, which is what you get if you 
put one third in for rho here. Okay, so this is one particular case. If you know, luckily the noise parameter you care about is one third. This quantifies the fact that in the one third noisy hypercube, remember this Markov chain where every step you like do a one third noisy copy of the vertex you're on. For a small set A of volume alpha, conditioned on you being in that set, if you do one step, the probability that you'll stay in that set is like alpha to the one half. Okay, so it's very small. Any question? Okay, so this is a nice fact to have. Even if it's only for this one special noise parameter that ultimately arose because we had the four norm in Bonami's lemma. Uh, let me make one small remark. We'll need it in a second. This is still okay even if f goes into minus one comma zero comma one and I write alpha for the expected value of absolute value or f. In other words, for the probability that f does not equal zero. Okay, it's just if sometimes you had one, you called it minus one, like nothing would change because the first thing you do on the right hand side is take the absolute value. Okay, and that corollary is particularly good as well. Um, because what's a common situation in which you might have a, a function whose range is minus one, zero, and one? Can anybody tell me? Derivative. Yeah, the derivative of a Boolean valued function. So let me call this the T corollary. It's like the tenth corollary of a corollary of the Bonami lemma. Let f be a function from the Boolean cube into minus one, one, our favorite representation of a Boolean valued function. And I'm going to think about applying this corollary with a derivative of f. Okay, so let alpha be the ith influence of f. Okay, and why? Uh, well, I'm going to apply this thing to g the ith derivative of f. Okay, so that function, if you remember, it does indeed map into minus one, zero, one. And on a given string x, it's zero if f is not sensitive to changing the ith coordinate on x. And then if it is sensitive, it's either plus or minus one, depending if it's flipping it monotonely or anti-monotonely. Uh, but in particular, this probability that g does not equal zero is exactly the ith influence of f. Okay, so the corollary that we get out of this is that then, well, it's a bit funny, the noise stability at one third of the ith derivative of f is at most alpha to three halves. Um, now that looks a little weird, the noise stability of a derivative. Actually, this is a natural concept. We'll talk about it more later. Um, this is called the one-third stable influence of I on F. And let's actually look at its Fourier uh, expression. So in noise stability one-third, you look at the sum over all S of one-third, well, to the cardinality of S times the S Fourier coefficient squared of this thing. And what are the Fourier coefficients of a derivative? Well, anything that doesn't involve the ith coordinate goes away. So you should really only sum over s's that contain i. And everything that does involve the ith coordinate, you kind of delete xi from that monomial. So it actually has the effect of decreasing the degree of that monomial by one. So you should actually put cardinality of s minus one here, f hat s squared. Okay, so this will be the key corollary we'll use, that this thing is at most alpha to the three halves. So as I said, it's, it's actually a kind of natural quantity. It even has a, some kind of combinatorial interpretation. Kind of if you like pick a random string and flip the ith coordinate, but also add some extra noise to the other coordinates. Um, it kind of measures like the influence of i, but like attenuated, so that the like high degree coefficients don't really count so much. 
So anyway, we'll talk about that concept more later, but it's a, I just want to tell you that this concept that shows up in this key corollary is somewhat natural. Okay, questions about that? Great. So what, you know, to say in words, what this means is that if you have a, any Boolean function and it has a small ith influence, then its one-third stable influence is actually much smaller. It's like alpha to the three halves. Okay. So now we have all the tools we need to prove uh, this Konkali linear theorem. Um, I was going to give you a long story about the original motivation for it, which came from a conjecture made by people working on distributed computing and collective coin flipping. But then I decided I just want to make sure that we actually get through the proof. So let me do the proof and I'll tell you some stories if there's time at the end. Okay, so here it is, Konkali lineal. From 1988, let f be a Boolean valued function. Then f always has at least co one coordinate with influence, basically at least log n over n. Let me write it like this. Then the max influence, I just mean here the maximum of the n influences, is at least. basically log n over n, uh, multiplied by essentially the variance in a universal constant. Um, this constant is even quite reasonable. It'll be like a seventh or something. And you, it's, you only have, you have to multiply it by the variance because if you have a function that is like very close to being constant, then of course it cannot have any large influences. And the variance is sort of the exact right scaling factor for this. But don't worry about it. If every time I write variance in this thing, I'm just doing it to be careful. Just think about it like, um, imagine f is a roughly unbiased function. Its mean is not really close to 1 or really close to minus 1, in which case you can think of variance as like a constant. Okay, so it basically says there's always a, a, a coordinate with influence at least log n over n. Uh, first of all, that's sharp up to the constant. We saw before there, there's this um, tribes function which is essentially almost unbiased, and all of its influences are at most O of log n over n. Uh, and at first, it doesn't look like that awesome. You, see, you can always get the maximum influence, at least the variance over n, by the Poincaré inequality, which says, very trivial, it says the sum of the influences is at least variance. So the maximum one has to be at least a 1 over n fraction of variance. And like this beats that argument by log n, which doesn't look that great. But somehow, it's the fact that this log n goes to infinity with n as like a function, uh, so ratio against the trivial argument 1 that makes all the difference. So hopefully, we'll eventually see that this is the reason that like in a monotone voting scheme, there's always like a, a sublinear number of voters who, if you bribe them, will almost surely control the election. And it's why there's, um, I don't know, uh, integrality gaps for uniform sparsest cuts that uh, are larger than any constant. It's because of the fact that this log n goes to infinity. And a number of other cases where this key theorem KKL gets used, where the fact that this log n is super constant is, makes all the difference. OK. Uh, in fact, one can even say something stronger than this, which we'll prove. Uh, we'll prove that the total influence, the sum of the influences, is at least, let me get this right, uh, the variance, just think of that as a constant if you want, times basically log 1 over the max influence. F, and maybe I'll put 9 here and I'll put 81 here. So I'll s explain to you in one second why this statement is actually stronger than this statement. Uh, this statement actually even looks a little bit funny. What it's saying is that if all of the influences are small, if 
the maximum influence is small, then this quantity is large. So it's saying if all the influences are small, then the sum of the influences is large. That sounds a little weird. It sounds counterintuitive, but there it is. It's true. If you have a function where all of the influences are small, so it's kind of not aligned with any one dictator, then it's the sum of its influences, which is, for example, related to its edge boundary, must actually be quite large. So it's also a kind of edge parametric, isoparametric inequality. Okay, so why is this better than this? Uh, it's because, well, some of the influences is certainly, at most, n times the maximum influence. Let me just write capital M for the maximum influence. That's clear. So then, if we rearrange this, that implies that I'll divide by this, like m over log 1 over m is at least the variance. Think of that as just a constant over n. Let me just stop. It's a little annoying. Let me just stop writing the variance and everything. 1 over n. So now you have like m over log 1 over m is at least 1 over n. Okay? So that, if you sort of solve it, it's, you can't really invert this, but that implies that m is at least log n over n. All right? Because you need to get like an extra log factor so that once you like log again and divide, you get 1 over n. Okay? Anyway, you can deduce this from this. Okay, so we're going to prove this one, this statement. All right, and uh, to prove this statement, it's now super easy. Uh, I mean, the hypothesis, if you think about it in this way, if all the influences are small, then the total influence is large. It's kind of clear that it's a good idea to use this corollary. I mean, this is, says something strong if all of the influences are small. It says that these one-third stable influences are even smaller. In fact, to prove this theorem from this corollary, you literally just apply it to each of the n coordinates, sum what you get, and then like mess around a little bit. Okay, so let's mess around a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, let's just sum the key corollary over at i. Okay, so we get the sum over i. Sum s contains i, one-third cardinality of s minus 1, f hat s squared, is at most sum over i, influence of i on f to three halves. Okay, and let me work on the right-hand side for a second. Uh, think of this as square root the influence times the influence. So I'm going to pull out the square root of the influence and maximize over it. Okay, so what I'm claiming is that this is at most the maximum influence. So one half times the sum of the influences. Okay, which is the max influence. Let me just write M for short times to the one half times the total influence. Is that okay? All right, great. So now I'll work on the left-hand side. Uh, this is where we just need to, oh yeah, it's your phone. <laughs> no problem. Uh, we just need to mess around a little bit. Uh, okay, first let's invert the sums. So we get sum over S. Uh, Okay, how many times, what factor do we get? We get one-third to the s, cardinality of s minus one, and then we count it once for each element of it. So we get a factor of cardinality of s, f hat s squared. Uh, right, let me just write this as, see, now everything just depends on the cardinality of s. So I'll write it as sum k goes from one to n of one-third let me even write it like this, 3 to the 1 minus k times k times the weight 
at level k of f. Okay, there's no k equals zero term because you have this factor of cardinality of f. Um, okay, let me just remind you of two formulas here. I hope at this point in the class you remember them, but if you don't, here they are. Uh, recall that the, the variance of f is the sum of all the weights except for the empty weight. And the total influence is the same thing, but you have this factor of k. Okay, so uh, let's see. So from this second formula, we know that total influence of f is at most uh, the sum for k between 1 and some parameter capital lambda. I'm going to choose some parameter capital lambda in a second of uh, lambda times the weight at level k. I just took this formula and I said the terms above degree k, I'll just drop them. And the terms up to k, I'll just say that this k is at most lambda. Uh, actually, let me say what I'm doing here. Uh, let's, yeah, let me take a little break. What do we have on the left-hand side here? We have something that kind of looks like the variance in the sense that it has some of the weights, but it has this term uh, that's going down exponentially fast in k. Okay. So what are the possibilities? One possibility is that this function f has lots of weight way up high. Okay? If it has lots of weight way up high, then its total influence is large. Okay? And that's great. If its total influence is large, then one of its influences has to be equally large, just divided by n. All right? We're only shooting for a relatively meager bound, log n over n. So if the total influence is bigger than log n, we're already done. Okay, the other possibility is that this function does not have a lot of weight up high, or in other words, let's say it has a lot of weight relatively down low. In that case, if it has a lot of weight relatively down low, then this 3 to the minus k factor is not so bad. It's not going to kill us too much. And so this will be, let's say, some constant fraction of the variance. Or not some constant fraction, but some like not too horrible fraction of the variance. Okay, and in that case, we'll get the total influences at least that divided by, wait, we'll get the max influences at least, uh, hmm. we'll get that the max influence is at least, I don't know, some like large-ish quantity divided by the total influence. Is that good? Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, we'll see how it proceeds. Okay, so from this uh, deduction, uh, let me tell you what the parameter is. Let me let where I'm going to take this parameter, lambda, to be uh, 2 times the influence over the variance. Okay, so if Think of variance as a constant. This lambda is maybe some like constant times the total influence. Okay, so this implies immediately that uh, if I look at the sum of the weights between degrees one and lambda, it's at least the total influence over this lambda which is the variance over 2. Okay, this is like some trivial calculation to show that uh, you know, if your influence is not too big, you cannot have like tons of weight above that degree. Okay? In other words, you know, a decent chunk of at least half your variance must come from the weights below uh, something like twice the influence. Uh, no, actually, this is carefully designed, I think, so that this 
makes sense even though lambda is not an integer. K is an integer parameter. Okay, so therefore, the left-hand side, I'm just remembering that here. Therefore, this left-hand side is at least uh, well, I can just say, look, I'll drop all the terms where k is bigger than lambda. So then I have this like exponentially going down factor times the weights between 1 and lambda. And the weights between 1 and lambda are at least the variance. And this exponential factor is not that bad. So it's at least the variance of f over 2 times you know, 3 to the 1 minus lambda times lambda. Okay, this function, 3 to the 1 minus k times k, is like decreasing in k. So like the most biggest disaster if all of this weight that be between 1 and lambda was right at degree lambda, in which case that would be this factor. Does that make sense? I kind of stumbled a bit here, but that's what's going on. Okay, so now we just rearrange everything and we're totally done. Uh, we have this is at least this. Okay, so let's see. Let's remember what each of the parameters is. Let me just plug back in what is, is lambda. This lambda I'll plug in for what it is. It's 2 times the total influence of f over the variance of f. Okay, and that's less than or equal to this. So now like everything cancels. The 2 goes away. The variances go away. The influences go away. It's like everything goes away. And we just get, uh, therefore, m to the 1 half is at least 3 to the 1 minus lambda. OK, and I'll just rearrange that over here. Uh, Yeah, so I'll square that and get, therefore, m is at least 9 to the 1 minus lambda, which is like 9 times 9 to the minus 2 total influence of f over variance of f. So therefore, that's like 81 to the minus that. So if I divide, I get like 81 to the total influence of f over variance of f is at least 9 over m. OK, and then I log that to the base 81. And I get influence over the variance is at least log 9 over m. OK, which is that? Okay, so there's like some slightly annoying manipulations, but literally like the proof was kind of over as soon as I wrote this line. We just had to see what we could get. Okay, so that's it. That's the KKL theorem. Any questions? Okay, uh, let's see. I have 15 minutes left. Oh, the next class is canceled, by the way, Monday. So I'm going to see you again in one week. It's Fox. So uh, that kind of motivates me to finish this like technical thing. Because if I don't finish it now, like, you'll never remember what's going on like a week from now. So if it's OK with you, I'm going to like blast through some like slight generalization of this while we're here. Uh, so what we're going to do is also prove this free gut theorem, which is extremely similar. Uh, free gut theorem. Somehow it got proved like 10 years later, even though it's almost the same proof. And basically it says if you have a, a Boolean function with really tiny total influence, let's say total influence is like k, think of k like it's like a big constant, then the function has to be close to a junta. The junta is of size exponential in k. So it essentially depends on most exponential in k many variables. Okay, so if the total influence is a lot smaller than log n, it says the function hardly depends on, you know, it depends on like a sublinear number of variables. Okay, so here is the theorem.
Let f be a Boolean function. And let epsilon be a parameter, say at most half. And let uh, lambda, which is some parameter similar to this, be uh, two times the total influence over epsilon. OK, and let's assume that this is at least two. OK. So what I kind of want to say is that I think of this total influence as being relatively small, like a big constant. I want to say that f really essentially only depends on a small number of variables. So which variables will it be? It'll be all those variables with large enough influence, which makes some sense. So let capital J be the set of all coordinates J, such that the total influence, or sorry, that the influence of that coordinate is at least uh, e to the minus 3 lambda. Okay. It's a slightly technical statement. So essentially let J be the coordinates with large influence, although again, think of the total influence as a constant, so this is just some small but constant number. Then F's uh, spectrum, Fourier spectrum, is epsilon concentrated on uh, the following collection. F, the set of all sets S, which are subsets of J and of not too big degree. Okay, so it's actually even better than saying it's close to a junta. It's a spectral concentration statement. If you have small total influence, there's some relatively small set of coordinates such that almost all of the spectrum is within those coordinates and even also at relatively low degree. Okay, and so we'll conclude, I guess, by proving this. But let me say what it's the conclusions we can draw from this are. First, uh, I keep saying that this set capital J is small. Why is that true? What's the biggest that capital, what's an upper bound on the cardinality of J? I claim if the total influence is like a constant, then it's at most some other constant. What can I put there? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it's at most the total influence times 1 over that, x 3 lambda, okay? Because the sum of the, all of the influences is this, and everything in J has influence at least that, so there can't be more than this many of them. And if you look at what lambda is, it's that. So this is at most, this is exponentially larger than this. So this is at most, like, I don't know, exponential in, like, 7. Oops total influence of f over epsilon. OK, so in particular, f has almost all but epsilon of its spectrum on this set. So if you just looked at, uh, so we know that f is epsilon close to the following Boolean function, just the sign of what you'd get if you dropped everything outside script f. This is just like in the uh, learning algorithms we saw. If you collect up like most of the Fourier spectrum and only epsilon is left, then if you just take the sign of the, the stuff that you have, that's a Boolean valued function which f is epsilon close to. And this function, this is a Boolean valued function, it only depends on the coordinates in j. Right? So this is a, this is a, an x7 total influence of f over epsilon junta. Okay, so any Boolean function at all, we have no hypothesis, it's epsilon close to a junta that depends on something like e to the total influence over epsilon variables. Okay, and this is Friedge's theorem.
OK. Uh, all right, so the last thing we need to do is prove this red technical thing. Oh, also in this uh, statement, you see, at most, this many coordinates are relevant. Plus, only sets of degree up to lambda are involved. So the spark, I mean, the number of terms here, the cardinality of f, is at most like this number choose lambda, which is something like exponential in O of the total influence squared over epsilon squared. OK, so not only is this not very many coordinates, but even this part is sparse. OK. So now let's end on a downer note by just doing some technical calculations. OK, so we want to show that uh, if you delete all the stuff that's not in script f, you've deleted at most epsilon of the spectrum. So one class of things that you deleted are uh, coefficients that are of degree bigger than gamma. OK, but this is the definition of gamma. We essentially know that that only costs you epsilon over 2. All right? If you recall, what I'm saying here is the sum, even over s's that are bigger than gamma over 2 of f hat s squared, is at most uh, the total influence of f over, wait, why did I write over 2? I just meant lambda, uh, which is epsilon over 2. OK, this is like, uh, you know, when we did the low degree learning algorithm, we said if your total influence is at most this, if you truncate to that total influence divided by epsilon, you get all but epsilon of the spectrum. So that's exactly what I did here. It's like Markov's inequality. OK, so uh, that's epsilon over 2 that we gave away. And now we just have to show that uh, we don't give away too much if we delete all the Fourier coefficients uh, s that are not entirely contained within j. Okay. So what is the opposite of being entirely contained within j? It means you intersect with j bar, the, the complement of j. OK, so we get the second part sort of just by summing the key corollary, just not over all i, but over all i in j bar complement of j. Sum it just over all the non-influential coordinates. OK, so here it is. What do we get? We get sum over i in j bar. Uh, sum s contains i, one third the cardinality of s minus 1, f hat s squared. At most, sum over i not in j. I wrote it in two different ways. That's for fun of uh, the influence of i on f to the 3 halves. OK, and the point here is, uh, by definition, j is all the things that have small influence. OK, so anything that's not in j, this influence is small. So I, again, I'll write this in my head as the influence to the 1 half times the influence to the 1. And for the first influence to the 1 half, I'll use this thing. So that's at most x minus 3 lambda to the 1 half times the sum i not in j of the influences. OK, and this is at most the total influence. So this is something like, I'll also remember the definition of lambda. Somehow the twos cancel, and we get uh, exponential minus 3 times total influence over epsilon times total influence. OK, and I'll do the same idea on the left-hand side that we did before. First, let me invert the sum. So I sum over all s's. Which s's, though? In order to get counted at all, you have to include an element which is in j bar. So sum over all the s's which meet j bar. Uh, let's see, one-third cardinality of s minus 1. 
And for each s, how many times does that get counted? It gets one, counted once for every time that it includes an element that meets j bar. So that's size of s intersect j bar times f hat s squared. Um, all right, and now I'll just say, oh, finally I can delete this corollary. <coughs> So let me just continue the left-hand side. I'll delete some terms. I'll delete the terms that are of degree smaller than uh, gamma. OK, so first, these are the sets that meet j bar. In other words, the sets that are not entirely contained in j. And I'll just drop them if they're bigger than gamma in cardinality. Sorry, bigger than lambda in cardinality. And uh, this S intersect J bar, I'll just say it's at least one if, if it's at least one, if S meets J bar. And so then on the inside here, I have one third to cardinality minus one. I'll say that's not too small because I'm only summing S's that are at most gamma. So that's, I can uh, lower bound by three to the one minus gamma. I have f hat s squared. Okay, so let me say that this is the sum over s not entirely contained with j, s of cardinality at most lambda, f hat s squared times 3 to the 1 minus lambda. Okay, so what I've got here is an inequality. Uh, if I bring this to the other side, that says this thing is at most something. And that's exactly what I'm shooting for, because this is some of the stuff that I dropped when going to this set, right? We already accounted, you know, when I go to this set, we already accounted for the stuff that's high degree. So the other stuff that we dropped is the stuff corresponding to sets S that are not entirely contained within J and are at most gamma, lambda in cardinality. Okay, so we have the epsilon over 2 here. It remains to show that this is at most epsilon over 2. OK, so we have some kind of bound on it. We just need to put this on the other hand side. So in fact, it's this thing is at most, bringing us the other side, 3 to the lambda minus 1 times this thing x minus 3 total influence over epsilon times total influence. All right, now we just need to remember what lambda is. It's somewhere there. OK, so it's 1 third. I'll just take the 1 third here. Uh, now we have 3 to the lambda, so that's like 9 to the total influence over epsilon. This is like over e cubed to the total influence over epsilon. And this is the total influence over epsilon times epsilon. I just put an epsilon in and deleted it. OK, so we have like one third epsilon. That looks good. We're trying to show that it's the most epsilon over 2. And then we have this thing, which is like 9 over e cubed to the t times t for t equals total influence over epsilon. Okay, and the e cubed is like 20 or something. So this is like a half to the t times t. I assure you that's at most 1. I mean, it's as assuming this, that t is at least 1. This is like 1 over t over 2 to the t. It's like at most 1. So this is at most 1 for all t bigger than 1. So this is at most even 1 third epsilon. Okay. Smaller than half epsilon. Okay, that's it. So I'll see you in one week.